have triggered a, a, a much larger interest in these events and their seismic hazard uh, potential. Next. So in Western Canada, which is an area where I've been working with, uh, with a number of colleagues at uh, different universities and government agents, uh, agencies across Canada, uh, in particular in the Western Canada Sedimentary Basin, which is the, the area that's uh, outlined in red and the figure on the left there, uh, it's, an, it's a, 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 a large uh, development basin, not unlike those in the, in the central U.S. in many ways. But in one way, it seems to be uh, a little bit unlike the central U.S. in that we've, we've also been seeing an increase in seismicity in the Western Canada sedimentary basin since about the same time as it began in the, in the central U.S., around 2007, 2008. Only in this region, the, uh, the increase is coincident not with the increase in disposal wells, but with the increase in the number of of um, hydraulic fracture wells, in particular lateral um, horizontal wells. And so one of the things that we've been working on in the last um, year or two uh, and came out recently in a paper in SRL is the uh, looking at the uh, statistical relationship between seismicity and hydraulic fracture wells. Next. So just for those of you who may not be familiar with what I call as a shorthand, I use the term HF well, as a shorthand for a laterally drilled uh, multi-stage horizontal well. And uh, these are really the kind of wells that we focused on as opposed to simple vertical wells which have been in use for a, a lot longer time and, and have a lower uh, potential to be associated with induced seismicity. So these uh, multi-stage laterals are shown here in, um, in, a, in a map view and also in a, in a cross-section view. And so essentially what happens is that there's a well that's drilled vertically first down to the depth of the formation, often about two kilometers or so. And then the well is turned horizontally and uh, drilling goes along for uh, oh several kilometers, uh, up to several kilometers in the horizontal direction. And then the frac operation proceeds uh, in stages by, by selectively plugging and treating uh, pieces of the, um, of, of the well. So the, the kind of uh, signature that that has in terms of pore pressure is quite different from wastewater injection. And that's what's shown on the, the bottom of the slide. If you consider a wastewater injection, you just keep putting the fluid in there and it just gradually diffuses and the, the more fluid you put in, the, the larger becomes the area um, and so on. Whereas for a hydraulic fracture operation, you're really stimulating it at, at very, very um, high pressure. So, uh, so it's, a, it, it's a very dynamic kind of treatment, uh, but it doesn't have the same uh, time constant. Uh, it might take up to perhaps as long as uh, three months or so for that pore pressure signature to dissipate, but eventually it will dissipate. So it's a different kind of a beast. Next. So what we did to look at the relationship between hydraulic fracturing in these lateral wells and seismicity uh, in Western Canada was uh, we obtained a, a, a publicly available database. Uh, it consists of about 500,000 wells of all different types, including the, uh, the wells that we're interested in. And uh, we made a search through this uh, well, through this well database with a, a piece of software called uh, GeoScout. It's actually an industry uh, software. And uh, this revealed uh, about 12,000 of these uh, horizontal HF wells and about 1,200 disposal wells that have been active in one way or another since 1985. And we correlated this with a catalog of uh, magnitude, moment magnitude 3 and greater earthquakes that we compiled for the same region. Uh, and details of that's on our website. Next. So the methodology was to start with an initial screening to identify 
um, all of the wells that had any magnitude 3 or greater earthquakes within a 20 kilometer radius and within three months of the treatment. Uh, 20 kilometers seems like a big radius. Uh, it considers a, a location uncertainty which is typically about 10 kilometers but, can, but in some places can be even greater than 20 kilometers especially in the earlier um, time. And we just uh, we take a deliberately take a broad radius initially, and then look at it in more detail later. The idea is that we don't want to miss anything in the first screening. We want to we want to cast a wide net and then look at it more closely. And we use a similar screening to identify disposal wells um, that contributed significant volume in the same time frame. And we also use a uh, Monte Carlo techniques then to assess the significance of the correlations that we find. Next. So in our initial screening we found uh, 52 HF wells out of 12,000, so about four in every thousand, that have magnitude greater than three associated with them within three months of treatment. Almost all of those are since 2009. And so to find out whether that's greater than what we would expect by chance, we did a Monte Carlo analysis where we generated 5,000 simulated catalogs for the time period 2010 to 2015. Um, and uh, what we did essentially was, was we, we kind of had a control catalog that used the seismicity from 1985 to 2009 and reproduced the observed clustering using a smooth seismicity model. It's kind of similar to what the USGS uses in its, um, in its hazard map program and we used those rates. And then if that's our, if that's our kind of a model for simulating activity, we find that for the period that we're looking at, 2010 to 2015, the 10th to 90th percentile hit rate of, of wells having magnitude greater than three within 20 kilometers and within three months of a treatment um, is about seven to 14. So we would expect to have seen seven to 14 hits just by coincidence and we actually saw 52. So uh, we know that it's not just a coincidence, although it's also worth noting that we do expect some false positives. So out of those 52, we might expect uh, about you know 10 or so to have happened just by chance. Next. So to take a look at things in more detail, we, th we then went for each one of those 52 that we saw in the initial screening, uh, we looked at them in more detail to see what was the pattern of, of, that was going on in that area around those wells. And in particular, uh, were there any disposal wells around there that, that could have played a role as well? And so this shows an example on this slide of that secondary screening. Um, for a case that uh, we believe that the hydraulic fracturing was the uh, was was the uh, main trigger, and so what this is showing the figure on the bottom uh, is a little map, and it shows um, a disposal well uh, in the center, and then it shows hydraulic fracture wells with green triangles uh, around it, and the larger green triangles are events that. Uh, came up as a hit in our screening um, for seismicity related to hydraulic fracturing and uh, the red dots are the are the those hits the magnitude greater than three and above earthquakes and so then what the plot on the top is showing is if we consider the idea that maybe it was really the disposal well that was the main factor uh, let's just kind of take a look at that so the top plot is showing ever since that disposal well started, in this case back in 2000, what was the monthly water disposal and the cumulative water disposal. And then the little sticks are showing uh, the earthquakes that happened around the hydraulic fracture wells that we identified as hits. And so, and, and the purple bars are the three month uh, window for hydraulic fracturing. So you can see that uh, water was being disposed for about 10 years or so without any seismicity at all. Uh, and then in these hydraulic fracture windows, the purple bars, when, they, when these operations took place, uh, 
um, that's when we got these magnitude greater than three earthquakes. So we look at this and we think that that's probably not a, a coincidence. So this would be one that we would tag as being uh, reasonable to say that there's an association between hydraulic fracturing and seismicity. Next. Uh, on the other hand, here's one that uh, passed the initial screening that we rejected as hydraulic fracture related uh, because the disposal well in question here was generating uh, or associated with seismicity uh, around it for quite some time before hydraulic fracturing began. And so you can see here uh, in this slide that uh, there's a, a history of both size of seismicity since the injection began and the two greater than three events that happened in 2014 could have been coincidental so we ruled this a, as disposal related although it's interesting that um, there hadn't been any magnitude three events here for about 50 and greater for about 15 years um, until that hydraulic fracture operation took place. So it could be that there's a that there's a combination of mechanisms going on here and I'll I'll get back to that. Uh, I'll say a little more about that in a minute. Next. And so while we were at this screening we also did uh, we, we used a consistent kind of approach to look for disposal wells that had magnitude 3 associated with it. Um, and this is a little bit trickier because for hydraulic fracturing, it's kind of easy to spot an association because we have such a short time window. And so um, that's kind of diagnostic. Disposal wells, you don't have that, uh, the luxury of a short time window. So you kind of have to look at, at the pattern of events around groups of disposal wells to, to come up with an association. And um, on this basis, we looked for every disposal well or, or clustered group of disposal wells in cases where they, they were too close together to distinguish them. Uh, and we looked at uh, how the uh, fluid volume had evolved and how the seismicity had evolved to see whether uh, the events appeared to be uh, associated. Next. So one of the interesting things that we found when we were looking at both disposal wells and uh, hydraulic fracture wells is um, I think that there may be a number of cases where both disposal wells and hydraulic fracture wells are involved. And perhaps what could be going on here is that a disposal well has increased in general the pore pressure uh, in a fairly significant area. And then if you start hydraulic fracturing in that same area, that might uh, be that sort of dynamic stimulation that actually pushes things over the top and, uh, and triggers seismicity. And so here's an example of, um, of that happening. We have some events that, that meet the criteria, the 20 kilometer initial screening for both HF wells and disposal wells. And if you look at the pattern of seismicity that's going on, uh, you can see on the, the lower right here that there have been uh, earthquakes that have been occurring uh, starting shortly after disposal began and um, predating the seismicity that occurs in the in the HF windows which are the purple bars but it does seem that there is some tendency for some of the larger events to to actually happen or cluster in these uh, in these particular uh, time windows um, so uh, so there may be some, um, some combination of mechanisms going on there. Next. So overall then, after concluding all of this uh, and classifying the events, uh, we came up with this uh, picture that's shown on the left here of the rates of magnitude 3 and above earthquake in the Western Canada sedimentary basin. Uh, since uh, since 1985 and moving on and the top plot is the uh, number of events or the count of such events each year um, that was associated with hydraulic fracturing the middle associated with disposal and the lower associated with tectonic so 
remarkably, uh, almost all of the earthquakes that, that we've seen since 1985 um, in this previously very inactive region uh, can be associated with oil and gas activity in some form or another. Uh, there's actually uh, about 60% or of the seismicity is is associated with the um, hydraulic fracture, and um, particularly in the last few years, that's what's really been uh, really been increasing. Uh, next. So uh, I, th I think I'll change uh, sort of change the uh, topic a little bit now and move into the the hazard part of the talk. So the reason why this induced seismicity is important as well as being interesting is uh, that I think that there's quite a significant hazard that's associated with these events, particularly if we're looking at um, critical infrastructure. Uh, that has a very high reliability uh, requirement, and uh, I don't think that those those hazards have have yet been been well recognized. And then, of course, the other reason why it's important is is that I think that uh, understanding induced seismicity really has the potential to to revolutionize our understanding in a broader context of how of, of how earthquakes work. I think if we can figure out how to turn earthquakes on and off with induced seismicity, we should certainly be able to learn uh, things about them that have much broader implications for, for tectonic hazards as well. Next. So looking at seismic hazard assessment then, uh, most of you probably already know that, uh, that the way seismic hazard assessment works is that we're aiming to find ground motions that have some target uh, probability level that's keyed to the consequences of a failure. So for example, in building codes like the uh, the US National Building Code and the Canadian National Building Code, uh, we are, are trying to design or build structures so that they will uh, survive a ground motion that has about a 2% chance of being seeded in 50 years. If it's a more critical structure, like a, a, a dam or um, uh, that type of a uh, that type of a structure, uh, often the target probability is about one percent in a hundred years, or one in ten thousand per annum. And for some structures, some nuclear power plant uh, criteria uh, go down to to uh, probabilities as low as one in a million per annum. And so because we've been doing these seismic hazard assessments for a long time, there's a very well established framework that's used to calculate hazard at a site, at least for natural seismicity. Next. So this next slide is that famous four part plot that I won't belabor because I think most people are, are well aware of this. It's showing, just to refresh your memory, the elements of a seismic hazard, hazard framework. First, we identify our seismic sources. Those could be faults, or they could be aerial sources. Those aerial sources could be natural seismicity sources, or they could be induced seismicity sources. For each one of our sources, we characterize the Gutenberg-Richter relationship so that we know how often earthquakes of different magnitude uh, happen in the source zone. Then we have a ground motion prediction equation that tells us what are the amplitudes of ground motion as a function of magnitude and distance. And when we put all those together, yeah, we can do the hazard integral to give us the probability of exceeding different levels of, uh, of ground motion. Next. So we've done that lots and lots of times for natural uh, sources. So if we were considering in Western Canada, say, and this would be very similar to uh, many parts of the of the central U.S. Uh, before Oklahoma uh, really turned on, say, uh, if we were considering uh, some relatively aseismic area in the middle of the stable craton, such as the one that's uh, shown there, we could define some very large uh, source zone. And so this slide is just showing two possible different definitions of a huge aerial source zone that includes the, the stable craton in the, in the center of the content, uh, continent. So we might first have some very large source zone. Next. <laughs> 
And then within that source zone, uh, we could look at what the uh, Gutenberg-Richter relationship would be. And um, I don't need to go into the details of this, but this just came from a study that um, I did with a colleague uh, some years ago, looking at what the average rates of earthquakes of different magnitudes were on a normalized basis uh, per uh, unit area per year for sites in the middle of the craton, depending on how you, how you um, averaged things and how you estimated them and so on. So we have some magnitude recurrence relations showing us how often we get earthquakes of different magnitude. Next. And then we have some ground motion prediction equation and this slide is really just meant to, to illustrate the general concept of a ground motion prediction equation where here we're showing the level of peak ground acceleration as a function from, of distance from the hypocenter for earthquakes of magnitude 4 in green going up to uh, magnitude 7 in, uh, in pink on the, on the top there. And uh, this is just from a uh, one of the NGA West ground motion prediction equations from uh, Boer et al. And a couple of lines have been drawn on there just, just for reference. One is about the, fat, the felt threshold is down around somewhere around 0.1% G or higher. Um, and that's shown down at the bottom. And then the threshold for potential damage is probably somewhere, depending on a whole bunch of different factors, between 5 and 10% G which is shown by the dashed red line up top. Um, and so you can kind of see there that uh, what would correspond to your general knowledge and expectation, you wouldn't be surprised then to see that if you have a magnitude 4 earthquake, you might feel it out to 100 kilometers or so if you were in the west. And um, generally that that magnitude 4 wouldn't take you above the damage threshold because you would need to be, um, at least for median ground motions, within about seven or eight kilometers or so of the hypocenter in order to go above that potential damage threshold. And um, for most earthquakes at typical depths, um, the, the depth of the event would be perhaps eight or ten kilometers as an average depth. And so most natural events of magnitude 4 are already far enough away from the hypocenter when you're on the surface that you'd fall below the damage threshold. And then you can see, of course, as you get up to larger magnitudes, uh, those, uh, those numbers change. And so it's kind of an important factor is that for natural ground motions, the depth of them um, has a, a, an important effect on limiting ground motions on surface. Next. And so then if we put all those elements together and we perform that seismic hazard calculation for a site right in the middle of the stable craton, in the middle of the continent, we get something that looks a bit like this. This is the peak ground acceleration um, plotted against the annual probability of exceedance. Uh, and again, I've got a couple of uh, lines on here. I'm pointing um, on the uh, one of those arrows is pointing to the probability level that's 1 in 2500 or 2% 2 in 50, that's the building code level. And the other arrow is pointing to the 1 in 10,000, which is a typical critical structures level. And that green line then is the mean hazard peak ground acceleration. And then I've also put on here that felt threshold way over on the left and the damage threshold of about 5% G over on the, the right in, in red. And so you can see that if you're in the middle of the stable craton for the natural hazard setting without any induced seismicity sources, uh, if you're interested in the building code probability level, the ground motions are so low that they're below the damage threshold to begin with. So this explains why you don't normally have to do a lot of seismic design in, uh, if you're in a uh, site in the middle of the, of the prairies. As you get down to a higher reliability uh, being required for critical structures, uh, then even if you're in the middle of the prairies, you kind of nudge just above the potential damage threshold, which is why for critical structures, uh, a seismic hazard analysis is always done, even if you're in an area that, that is not very high seismicity. Next. <clears throat> 
Okay, so that, that's the natural seismicity. So what happens if we stick an induced seismic source right in the middle of, uh, of all that? Let's pick a, let's take a site that's in the prairies and say, uh, what happens if we uh, induce seismicity? Does that significantly alter the likelihood of strong ground motion? Um, so we don't know specifically if we start an operation whether or not it will trigger seismicity, but we do now have a statistical model that I went through earlier um, for you. And that statistical model, for example, says that in the Western Canada sedimentary basin uh, for hydraulic fracturing, about 0.3% of those uh, wells uh, are associated with a sequence of event that has at least one magnitude three or greater event in it. Next. So we can evaluate what effect that has on seismic hazard by adding a, a, a new seismic source. Let's take a little box about 10 kilometers by 10 kilometers and um, for the seismicity parameters, the Gutenberg-Richter relationship, we'll look at a typical sequence uh, that was initiated in 2014 in the, uh, in the Fox Creek area uh, of Alberta, which is a, a small town uh, which is uh, not too far west of Edmonton that has become uh, rather famous for hydraulic fracture related seismicity in recent years. And we can look at a range of different activity rates with different B values, magnitude uh, distributions, and so on, uh, and see what kind of hazard we could associate with such a source. And one thing to note is that there's kind of two things to consider here. We can consider one scenario in which we, um, we are using parameters for seismicity that we've already activated. Uh, and this would be comparable to what the USGS is doing in its year-by-year -year induced seismicity maps, for example, saying let's look at the seismicity that happened last year and cast that into a hazard analysis. The other thing that we could do, which for future developments, uh, for assessing the risk associated with them is perhaps more relevant, um, and that is we could consider that we don't actually know the activation probability, the likelihood of getting a sequence. And so we can look at things in, in two different ways there. Next. So, uh, so what we did then was say, say you are going to be sitting on the top of a new induced seismicity source, a little box 10 kilometers by 10 kilometers, like in Fox Creek, and uh, we used the observed seismicity in uh, one year in a small box like that in the Fox Creek area to come up with a, a range of typical magnitude recurrence uh, relations. And this comes from a, a, a paper with, uh, with co-authors um, Gofrani and Asatorians in the um, seismological research letters last year. Uh, and uh, without getting into details, um, even though we know the events cluster in time, if we start by saying, well, let's just look at how many of them we got in a one-year period and look at what typical uh, magnitude recurrence rates we might assign as a result. Um, we looked at um, just the sort of the number of events uh, on a normalized basis and um, if we consider uncertainty in rates and also uncertainty in B values, we can look at what the different implications are um, for hazard. Next. So uh, this shows the, the result of, of such a calculation. And um, here we're showing the uh, annual probability of exceedance for different um, strengths of ground shaking on the x-axis for uh, two different response spectral uh, frequencies, one hertz on the, the top left, five hertz on the top right, and then peak ground acceleration and peak ground velocity um, on the bottom. And um, again, I've, I've uh, used a green line here to indicate the, uh, the one in 10,000 per annum uh, probability level that's particularly important for uh, uh, for critical structures. The red line is the hazard curve that we got for each one of those parameters from just the natural seismicity before we add that little source on. 
and then the uh, what the um, gray line is showing us is, uh, or the gray shaded regions are showing us is what the hazard curve is for the induced seismicity source if we consider a range of values um, for the minimum magnitude that we use in the hazard integral when we when we integrate hazard we start at some minimum magnitude um, typically for natural events it's often something like four and three quarters for induced events it would probably be lower and so we're showing the effect of the minimum magnitude here in the range from three and a half to four and a half um, through that sort of gray bars there and we're also showing the effect of different B values uh, anywhere from one to two. Uh, I should say that most of the sequences that we've seen certainly in the Western Canada Basin um, have B value sequences closer to one. Um, it has been argued that uh, some induced seismicity has much steeper B values and so we're considering quite a, a wide range here for illustration purposes. So you can see on this plot that when you get down to probability levels that are important for critical structures or even just for the building code that um, in an area like Fox Creek where we're actually seeing a lot of activity the ground motion that you're getting from the induced seismicity source is much larger than you would get from the natural uh, source um, quite often dramatically so um, for a wide range of assumptions of mn and uh, also for the uh, the b value next so that's uh, an area like fox creek where we looked at what happened in a particular year 2014 but what if we're thinking of drilling there next year and we don't know what the likelihood is of initiating a sequence or if we, we're not drilling in fox creek maybe we're going to drill somewhere else in the region and so then it's not really fair to just treat this induced seismicity source as a de facto uh, generating this seismicity. We have to consider that there is some um, likelihood that that seismicity that we observed is, is essentially conditioned on the probability of, of activation. And so here we consider the, the uh, a probability of activation for uh, a new operation that we haven't started yet in the region to be say anywhere from one in a hundred to one in a thousand um, and we show uh, then what the what the effect is uh, here we've assumed that B value of one which seems to be typical for for most of the sequences that we've seen uh, we we assume a, a minimum magnitude of 4.0 which is kind of in the middle of the range and the gray is showing you how the ground motion that you would calculate varies with that activation probability and you can see that's a very important parameter that you can get you, you'll you will increase the ground motion by factors of, of uh, two to five quite easily by changing the activation probability by um, by an order of magnitude next So then to kind of um, look at that a different way, this is looking at a uniform hazard spectrum which is commonly used in engineering. What it's showing is the amplitude of ground motion as a function of vibration frequency. And uh, this is typically used as, a, as an input to engineering analysis where if you know the fundamental frequency of your building, then you're looking at uh, the amplitude that's associated with that. And so here the heavy black line is for this site in the middle of the craton what the uniform hazard spectrum uh, would be for uh, for input to a, a building design or uh, in this case not a building a, a critical facility one in ten thousand um, from the natural seismicity that's the heavy black line is the natural seismicity and then the other lines are from the induced seismicity for various different combinations and uh, it's probably most useful to focus on the upper lines because those are the lines that you would get for a B value of one for different values of the minimum magnitude three and a half four or four and a half so that's just kind of showing sensitivity to minimum magnitude and also to B value the lower curve 
is what happens if you reduce the B value or increase it, however you want to consider that, to 2. Next. So if we look at a very similar plot, but now we look at the effect of maximum magnitude, um, here we're showing the same thing, but uh, up top we're showing for that B value of 1 having a maximum magnitude of 5 or a maximum magnitude of 7. Uh, and we've assumed this uh, a probability of activation of, of uh, 0.01 here. And uh, we've assumed a, a fixed value here of um, M min of uh, three and a half. And so it might come as a surprise to some people that although obviously there is a sensitivity to maximum magnitude, it's perhaps not as large as what you might um, what you might imagine. In fact, when we look at things overall for a lot of applications, the minimum magnitude is actually more important than the maximum magnitude for the hazard calculation. Next. Okay, so this is just kind of a, a an overall summary then, I guess to wrap that up of showing um, how the induced hazard curve might compare to the natural hazard curve for a, a site in a low seismicity environment where here now the um, the green curve is the peak ground acceleration from the natural hazard and the purple curve is the uh, peak ground acceleration from the uh, induced seismicity hazard. If we assume a nominal likelihood um, that an operation will induce seismicity of 1 in 500 and nominal values for a minimum magnitude of 4 and take a, a maximum magnitude having some likelihood distribution that ranges anywhere from four and a half to six and a B value of one. And so you can see that the induced hazard curve um, has much higher ground motions associated with it uh, than does the natural uh, event curve and particularly at the uh, probabilities that, that we're interested in um, that's really where the, the damage potential lies. Next. Okay, so the conclusions then on the induced seismicity hazard uh, are, uh, I think I've actually uh, gone over most of these already. It can greatly exceed the natural hazard. Uh, from the sensitivity studies we've done, the, the important parameters are uh, the activation probability, the B value, um, the ground motion prediction equations, which I'll talk about a bit more in a minute, uh, and the minimum and maximum magnitudes. Next. Okay, so I want to, uh, before I wrap up, just um, say a little bit more about the um, analysis of ground motion prediction equations. So this is kind of some work following up from an initial study I did in the bulletin in uh, 2015 on um, how to model ground motions uh, from small to moderate events at short hypocentral distances, which is really what the induced seismicity problem uh, is all about. And in the initial look at this, I used the data from the NGA West 2 project. So these are California uh, earthquake data plotted here um, with different color-coded symbols. The black dots are earthquakes of about magnitude 3.5. The purple dots are about 4.5. And, and the green dots are about 5.5. And, and then the lines are showing the developed um, equations uh, for that. And you'll notice that when you're within 10 kilometers of the hypocenter there, which I've marked, um, the data start to get uh, pretty thin. And um, that is one of the, the challenges for induced seismicity ground motion prediction equations is um, how to project those motions back to the short hypocentral distances that we're interested in. If we're right on top of an induced earthquake of magnitude 3.5 or 4.5, uh, our hypocentral distance might be as short as two or three kilometers, which is way over to the left side of that plot. And that's where we really want to, to predict. Next. And so um, uh, this leads into a couple of the key issues that I just want to overview very briefly for you. Uh, 
uh, stress drop and its dependence on focal depth, uh, main shock versus aftershock stress, and then that near source distance scaling that I just mentioned. Next. Okay, I'm going to start with stress drop and then come back to that near distance scaling. So uh, with a colleague, Emre Yenier, um, over the last uh, couple of years, we've, uh, we've done a, a, quite a bit of work on looking at the, um, uh, how, stress, how the stress parameter in the context of a ground motion model, there's a, a, a commonly used ground motion model that's based on uh, stochastic simulation where the parameters are, are calibrated with regional data. And uh, one of the, the important parameters that uh, captures the strength of the high frequency ground motion, or in fact the parameter that captures it, is the stress parameter, uh, which is, which is uh, equivalent to um, sort of the Brune uh, model stress parameter for an omega squared source model. And uh, what's shown here uh, in the blue dots is uh, work that we published last year showing for Central and Eastern North America, which we call SENA, um, how that stress parameter controlling the strength of the high frequency radiation scales as a function of moment magnitude on the right and focal depth on the uh, left. And um, you can see that uh, the, the, the dominant effect there is that there's a, quite a strong trend to increasing stress with focal depth until you get up to about 10 kilometers or so and then it appears to be relatively constant. Um, in some recent work uh, that uh, I've been involved in with both Emra Yanyer and uh, Daniel Sumi, we've been looking at the uh, stress parameters for a sequence of earthquakes in uh, Prague, Oklahoma. Uh, and uh, that work, which is, um, which is in review at the bulletin, is shown by the red dots. And in particular, one of the things that we noticed was that the the, the main shock events of the Prague sequence, these are the larger three events, um, as you can see on the, the right, the, the two events that had magnitude near 5 and the 5.7, those events had large stress drops or stress parameters compared to the uh, aftershocks that immediately followed them that were much lower in stress. And um, so that's something that's very important to consider. It would be easy to take a bunch of earthquakes from one of these sequences and come up with some average stress and reach a conclusion that the uh, stress drop of the events was really low. If you didn't um, specifically distinguish between the larger main shock events, which from a hazard perspective are the ones that you're really interested in, and a lot of those weaker aftershocks of lower magnitude that happened later. Next. So now I want to get back to, um, to sort of ground motion scaling at, at close distances. Uh, this is something that is largely controlled by the functional form in a ground motion prediction equation. And this slide here is showing, uh, it's from a paper by Douglas et al, and it's showing a bunch of ground motion data and different functional forms that go through them. And the main point that I wanted to make here is that you can see that those different ground motion prediction equations that have been drawn through the data or fit through the data um, have different rates of saturating or rolling over and getting flat as you get to very short distances. And those different forms will have huge implications for the predicted motions. You can see there uh, factors of more than 10 um, in difference in predicted amplitude, depending on uh, what kind of a saturation um, form that, that you consider. Next. So, and this is just showing uh, an important aspect of that uh, ground motion saturation, and that is that it has to be magnitude dependent. And that's a key feature that ground motion equations for induced seismicity have to build in, is that as you get down to smaller magnitudes, you get a, a, a steeper uh, behavior near the source than you do for, for larger magnitudes. And this plot is uh, just showing for earthquakes of about magnitude 7, the saturation behavior as you get close to the, um, to the source, compared to earthquakes of about magnitude 4, 
uh, and their saturation behavior as you get close to the source. Uh, you can see that the attenuation is much steeper for the magnitude 4 events at close distances um, and also in this plot which comes from the MGA West 2 uh, you can see the uncertainty in how that roll-off actually behaves um, which is something that I looked at in the, my 2015 paper by considering uh, two different forms of the near distance uh, saturation which I've shown by the, the two different um, blue lines there. One that has a, um, a, an effective depth which is what's controlling this roll off of about three kilometers and one that has one of only about one kilometer at magnitude four. And you can see that it makes a big difference to the ground motion in really close. Next. So that effective depth term that controls that roll off um, scales as a function of magnitude. And this slide is just showing uh, different values of that uh, parameter calculated from ground motion data, how it scales with magnitude according to different uh, relationships that are used in different uh, GMPE uh, functional forms. And so, for example, in the 2015 equation that I used, I considered the black and the orange lines as two alternatives. Next. So uh, some recent work that um, has been done using data from Geysers, California, is trying to use small magnitude data to try and um, constrain this value of the effective depth term uh, better. And um, I'm, I'm going to sort of breeze through the details of this pretty quickly because I see we're running short on time. Um, this is just showing uh, how that parameter scales as a function of magnitude compared to different uh, relationships um, that have been used and I think that this work will help us in the future uh, constrain that parameter. Next. So if we put together uh, recent work on uh, the near source scaling uh, with uh, how in general ground motion scale uh, with moment magnitude. Um, I've come up with this plot here where in California uh, I'm comparing the scaling of motions with, uh, with magnitude for uh, geysers, which is induced events, to NGA West 2, which are natural events. And so what these plots are showing is on the left we're looking at um, spectral acceleration for three different uh, periods and at the right we're looking at peak ground acceleration and velocity. So let's just look at the right for a minute, the peak ground acceleration and velocity and um, how that behaves if you're right on the epicenter as a function of moment magnitude. So I've taken the um, closest distance here um, that corresponds to being right at the epicenter. So the geysers events have depths of about one and a half to three kilometers. So that this the uh, an epicentral distance of zero corresponds to a hypocentral distance of about uh, two kilometers or so. Whereas for the natural events, um, I'm including here if all the events that have depths less than eight kilometers, but they still have an average depth of about five kilometers. So that even the shallow events in the natural data set are about a factor of two closer to the surface, or farther from the surface, rather. And so those two effects, kind of, you can see the way they work here in this plot, that um, you have ground motion scaling with magnitude, and when you switch to the natural events, the NGA West events, those are the, 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 um, the filled dots, the amplitude at the epicenter for a given moment magnitude um, is lower than it would be for the uh, induced earthquakes. So even though the, um, the stress drop would be a little bit higher because the depth is greater, um, that is more than compensated by the, the, um, the focal depth effect. Okay, next. Um, and then this is just a final um, sort of ground motion slide from a uh, paper that was presented by uh, Yenyer and others at the recent uh, SSA meeting uh, in Reno.
This is showing peak ground acceleration and velocity for uh, a magnitude 4.2 earthquake uh, that was associated with hydraulic fracturing in the Fox Creek area uh, this year. And the, um, the observations are shown as a function of um, hypocentral distance. Uh, the, the P black is peak velocity and the gray is acceleration. And it's shown in comparison to um, three different variations of ground motion prediction equations for induced events. The two red curves are the, the model that um, I came up with last year in the bulletin for the two alternative um, depth terms. And then the blue line is uh, from Yenyer and Atkinson uh, model for um, earthquakes in Central and Eastern North America for a similar magnitude. And that this kind of highlights an interesting interplay that happens. Uh, one, people who are familiar with ground motion prediction equations might wonder why the blue curve, which is a model for um, the central U.S., is so close to the red curve, which is a model for California. And there's a couple of competing things going on here. Our model for the central U.S. has a focal depth term built into it. So it's being plotted for a shallow focal depth, a focal depth of uh, uh, only four kilometers, whereas the uh, red curve is for uh, the western U.S., but it's based on NGA West 2, and so it inherently is applying to a deeper, um, a deeper event. So I think what's happening here is that in the central and eastern U.S., on average, stress drops are higher than they are in the western U.S., but because of that, um, focal depth scaling with, with depth, the way it works out is that for uh, induced events in the central and eastern U.S., their ground motion is actually pretty similar to what you would expect for natural events in California. That, in other words, they have similar stress drop. And so um, quite probably fortuitously, I will freely admit that uh, it was probably quite lucky that this particular event, uh, which is the first one that we've had good ground motion data for, um, agreed so well with, with some of our preliminary ground motion prediction equations. I am almost positive that in the future that luck will not hold and we'll see way more discrepancies than we're seeing in this figure. Next. Okay, so I guess that brings us to conclusions. Uh, hazards from induced seismicity uh, I think pose a, a, a very significant uh, risk particularly to critical infrastructure and we need to understand uh, the processes in a way that allows us to quantify that risk. Uh, so when we're doing research on induced seismicity, uh, we need to be thinking about things like uh, ground motion scaling for moderate events at short distances, and also uh, we need to better understand the factors that control the probability of induced seismicity uh, in different geologic settings and for different types of operations. Thank you. I'm ready for questions. Thank you so much, Gail. Um, yeah, as Gail mentioned, you can um, write down your questions in the question box on your uh, GoToWebinar control panel. Um, just to get us started, um, one of the things that you mentioned, Gail, was that the minimum magnitude for uh, is more important for hazard calculations compared to the maximum magnitude. And yes. um, I actually hadn't, you know, I didn't really think about that before, especially because when we think about, you know, critical infrastructure and, you know, earthquakes happening next to nuclear power plants or, you know, what have you, mm -hmm. we think about the maximum. So I, I wondered if you could elaborate a little bit about the minimum magnitude end, because that was kind of new to me. Yeah, so the... Um, the minimum magnitude is, uh, for, for those who aren't all that familiar with, with hazard calculations, the, the integral is conducted over a range of magnitude, from minimum to maximum. And the minimum is, is chosen as um, generally the smallest magnitude that we believe that could be contributing to the hazard. So for natural earthquakes, from empirical experience over decades, um, most people have observed that when you've got natural earthquakes, uh, it's very rare to see damage from anything that's very much smaller than magnitude 5 or perhaps magnitude 4.5. Mm -hmm. um, but if you look at that in, for induced earthquakes, the equivalent ground motion for an earthquake that's 4.5 to 5 at a depth of 10 kilometers 
um, is going to have about the same ground motion as you would see for an earthquake of say about a magnitude 4 at a depth of 3 kilometers or so. So um, if we're looking at the hazard implications, we should be adjusting the minimum magnitude so that we're looking at the same ground motion level um, and because that would be what we would presume to have about the same um, damage potential. There's actually a very nice article that kind of illustrates how that works that was in the bulletin um, by uh, Bourne et al. where they um, showed a hazard calculation for a, uh, um, an induced seismicity operation and they showed that actually most of the contributions to hazard were coming from um, earthquakes that were uh, in the magnitude uh, 4 to uh, 5 range. Great, thank you. Um, we did get a lot of questions in, so I'm glad I started with that primer. Um, Will Lewandowski asks, uh, where do you get the activity rates that you use in your PSHJ? Uh, well, actually, we when we first did that PSHA, we kind of made the activity rates up. Uh, uh, by activity rates, I'm thinking he's meaning the activation probability. Um, I'll answer it two ways. I'll answer it two ways because I know the way this works. It's, it's hard. He's probably typing furiously now. So first I'll assume that he meant activation probability and then I'll assume that he meant the rate given that the sequence begins. So um, activation probability then um, would come from these regional studies where we look at what is the association rate. So for example, um, on average, we see 0.3% of hydraulic fracture wells have one of these sequences with a magnitude 3 or above associated with it. So we could use that, for example, as an estimate of the activation probability. Once a sequence is initiated then, what we could do is look at the Gutenberg-Richter relationship of other sequences that, had, um, that have been initiated in that area. Um, and use that to come up with the magnitude recurrence relation um, for, uh, for sequences. And there's some tricky stuff in there about the way you, you kind of normalize things. Uh, we're used to normalizing on a per annum basis. And I think if we're considering a number of operations that happen in a little area in a year, that's still a reasonable thing to do. You can kind of um, put a number of operations together, and even though they might be turning on or turning off, you still have some rate of magnitude threes that you would expect to see um, in a year. Great. And uh, in, a more, in a more, just to kind of answer that maybe even a little more fully, eventually I think in probabilistic hazard analysis what we would want to do is move beyond um, a Poisson type process where we assume that those events are randomly distributed in time and come up with more detailed models that deal with the actual temporal clustering um, of events. I think that that work is entirely feasible. It just sort of hinges on a better characterization of the, the magnitude and temporal distributions. Right. Yeah, because I think he asked a follow-up question about the declustering, um, if you did it and why and why not, and I think that temporal yeah. Well, actually, <laughs> in the induced seismicity hazard, you, you really don't want to decluster. Essentially, what you would be doing then is removing all of the hazard. And um, that question about declustering is a really interesting one because um, that's what people have historically done in seismic hazard analysis is decluster the catalog um, and remove um, all of the events that happened in clusters, including all induced events. But if the induced events are the largest part of the hazard, then clearly you don't want to decluster the catalog and remove them all. Great. Thank you, Gail. Um, Luciana Estes writes in, um, given that there are different attenuation regimes in Western and Eastern North America, have you looked at the role of Q from induced seismic events? Hmm. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, the uh, Yes, there are different attenuation regimes, but those come into play mostly at larger distances. Uh, I think that the, the, the by far the lion's share of the contribution from induced hazard, because it's coming from moderate events generally, um, it's mostly coming from events that are close by. So I think most of the hazard is coming from within about 10 to 20 kilometers where 
the dominant effect is geometric spreading rather than Q. And that appears to be similar in the, in the East and the West. Great, thank you. Um, so we have a question from Irfan Ula, and I'm sorry if I'm mispronouncing your name, um, from the University of Sao Paulo. So definitely have an international reach. Um, uh, so I'm going to try to read this question. It's kind of a, a complex one, like a couple parts. Um, how do you know some events are caused by disposal wells while some are caused by hydraulic fracturing wells versus like the natural tectonic activity? And another question is the depth of the hydrofracking. Um, if it's shallow as compared to the tectonic earthquakes, um, which occur at like deeper than the hydraulic fracturing wells, so does the fracturing, uh, does it affect it deep enough to contribute to triggering like another event? Okay, so uh, first of all, how we know that um, it, it's not tectonic, largely that would be based on um, seismicity that initiated in an area that hadn't had it before. So um, if we have an area where, and it's relatively easy um, in a place like Western, in the Western Canada sedimentary basin, because the natural seismicity rates were so low. This would be much trickier in California where there's a high natural seismicity rate. Um, but our rates are so low that you'll have areas where there was literally no seismicity at all that was observed until you begin these, op these um, operations. So that's the key discriminating factor between tectonic and, and, um, and um, induced then would be whether there was any kind of activity uh, before the operations began. Uh, and then in terms of depths, the uh, events that are, are being triggered are at much, much shallower depth than the natural seismicity. That's another um, characteristic that, that um, uh, is helpful for a discriminant. If the, if the event had a focal depth of, of 10 kilometers, uh, it would be very unlikely to be a triggered event. If it had a focal depth of 2 kilometers, it's much more likely. Um, well, Lewandowski asks a follow-up question that I think kind of leads off of this. If there was any scrutiny of the types of hydraulic fracturing, like volumes or depth or length of the frack itself? Um, to the extent possible. Um, the difficulty is that not all of that information isn't all um, organized in the public databases. So um, the um, we can sort of make some generalizations about the the overall volumes that are used in an area, but we don't have well by well information on, um, on, on, on each one of those. There are some studies that are being done by the Alberta Geologic Survey that are attempting to actually do just that, that are trying to look in, in more detail at uh, operational parameters well by well and the relationship with seismicity. And I expect that we'll see some interesting results coming out from them in the, in the coming months. Great. Um, Ken Anderson asks, um, I know that you mentioned one of the discriminants that you looked at for hydraulic fracturing was that it occurred near the onset of the fracturing window. Um, did you actually see this in all of the cases that you analyzed? Um, yes, in that the, the ones that we associate with hydraulic fracturing, they, they occur in this relatively narrow time window, which we've defined as being three months. Although we define it as three months, most of the events are, are actually in, in a much shorter time window. So there's, there's a bit of a bimodal distribution. There's, um, a num there's a lot of events, a lot of the events happen right away, like within um, a day or two of the hydraulic fracture operation. Um, and then there's kind of a, a second lump or mode of events that happen later. And this has been seen in a lot of the hydraulic fracture operations is that um, sometime the, uh, the event um, that is triggered actually occurs um, several days after the hydraulic fracture operation has ceased. Hmm. So which is presumably the time constant or the amount of time that it's taken for the um, increased fluid pressures to find their way to uh, a fault surface. Great. Um... Feng Wang um, asks a question about your induced GMP redline, that it seems like there's no near source saturation, and if you could comment on that, that's the case or not? That depends on magnitude. So uh, there's very little um, to no saturation if you're looking at an earthquake that has only a magnitude, say, three or so. 
then uh, you gradually get increasing saturation as magnitude um, as magnitude grows. Mm -hmm. So by the time you get up to a four, um, there's a there's a, a a saturation distance of a couple of kilometers, and then that's steadily rising. Okay, great. And then um, I just have one last question myself. I know a lot of what you looked at was um, in Alberta with Fox Creek and, and things going on in the West Coast too, and so that was kind of one of the reasons you used NGA West, but especially with things that are going on in the Central and Eastern mm. US. Yep. Um, I loved sitting in the session at SSA on NGA East, and mm -hmm. but I still think that we have a problem with the short distances and especially, you know, what we're really experiencing for the induced seismicity cases. But I wondered, you know, it's just kind of like an, a way to wrap up, um, if you could comment on kind of where you think that's going and, and the impact that will make for induced seismicity. Right, and I think it, it is important to look at uh, data from both the East and the West. And in fact, in the Fox Creek area and in Western Canada, uh, we view that as being um, a, a central and eastern uh, U.S. type attenuation environment. And so um, overall, if you're looking at the, the larger attenuation, I think it would be more like the, the central U.S. Um, however, I don't, uh, well, I believe that there are, dis there are distinct differences between the east and the west in the overall level of stress drop, with the stress drop being higher in the east than the west by about a factor of three. Um, studies that we have done on the scaling of ground motions using East and West database uh, indicate that they both scale with focal depth in a similar way. So you can kind of think of two parallel curves showing uh, increasing stress with focal depth, one for the East and one for the West, and the Eastern curve is, is higher. Um, and so uh, I think we can use the same steps in the east and the west and just um, and just adjust for the the stress drop and um, that also gets point back to the point I was making on the on the um, um, the last slide the one before this one um, in fact I guess you can probably just go back to that if you go back yeah that slide there um, the red curves are for the west and the blue curve is actually for the east and the reason they're so similar is what I was mentioning is that the higher stress drop in the east mm -hmm. is compensated for by the shallow focal depth mm -hmm. um, of induced events. So that the blue curve is a uh, typical stress drop for a shallow event in the east and the red curve is for a typical stress drop for a deeper event in the West. And those two factors offset each other so that the curves end up being not too different. Mm -hmm. And so I think that that is something that we can use in um, hazard, uh, use to our advantage in hazard studies, is take advantage of Western ground motion data at very close distances to see how that scaling behavior works. Great, and there was actually one last, kind of last minute question. Um, well, Lewandowski asks about, you know, government regulations and wondering if the Canadian government does require seismic monitoring of hydrofrac wells um, and kind of how that, maybe that's moving within the government. If the, I, I missed part of the question, if the Canadian uh, government... Uh, does the Canadian government require seismic monitoring of hydrofrac wells? Um, that's, a, hmm, let's see. Sort of uh, yes and no. I guess that there has been in in some areas, in areas where there's been induced seismicity, in um, in BC, um, they are generally requiring uh, dense monitoring in certain areas, um, although they're not requiring that that data be made public. Um, they're requiring the data be available to the regulator, which is something quite different. Uh, and in, um, in Alberta, in specific areas, in, in Fox Creek, they need to have uh, monitoring in place that is capable of essentially um, detecting if they have magnitude greater than two uh, events and, and reporting to the regulator. Again, in that case, there's no requirement that those data be made public. Um, they just have to be re reported to the, um, the regulator. Um, but if the event in Alberta, if the event exceeds uh, magnitude 4, then the data does become public. 
Okay, I see. And and Will just said he wanted to uh, clear his name that it was a question from Rob Williams. Um, ah, okay. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yep. Um, but um, mm -hmm. that concludes our questions. And um, in this event, uh, that concludes our webinar too. And so, Gail, I just want to thank you so very much for your uh, your great um, commentary and your great presentation on what's going on and. Um, Kind of giving us a really good earthquake engineering perspective of uh, what's going on uh, in Fox Creek, especially. I know that um, your article certainly got a lot of press, and um, thank you so much for shedding light on that and for all the hard work that you do. And so, um, with that, well, thank you, <laughs> thank you, Danielle, and thanks everybody for listening. Yeah, thanks, Gail, and uh, that concludes mm -hmm. the webinar. Take care, everybody. Have a good day. All right, bye, bye. all. <laughs>